question of, ha of Hamlet's relationship with, with um, Ophelia. Very vexed one. Very troubled. We, we got into it last time a little bit. Um, and from the, on the basis of what we know within the story, we know that Hamlet has expressed or had been made to believe, or Ophelia rather, had been made to believe that Hamlet loved her because he wrote letters testifying to this. He wrote her love letters. Um, and in so doing, probably expresses something in the courtly love tradition. He's, he's wooing her. His family have rightly spoken to Ophelia and suggested, although he does this, he is not a man wholly in control of his own life. He is the, he is the prince. And he's above your station. And you should not get above yourself. Because even if he wants to marry you, which he may do, it's not only he that's going to be able to make this decision. It will be his father and mother that make that decision. And they're not going to want you as, their, uh, as the future queen. There's no connections. There's no political connections that come with it. And in general, the houses, the royals, are required to marry those of their own station in life. And that's the, that's the politics of Europe up until very recently. Um, wherein we see a significant difference, and I'm not sure it's actually better myself, but never mind. I don't need to get into that business. Um, but does he really love her? Well, uh, this is a complicated question. And we tend to think of it only on a personal level, on the level of, of eros. Does he love her in that sense? Uh, he appears to. Um, but there's another level, and this is more of a a Renaissance Platonic level that I'm speaking of here, where in beauty and love are capable of drawing upwards our mind towards God through stages of activity, like a, like a stair. There's a ladder of ascent, wherein the mind is drawn from beauty in this world towards the ideal which the beautiful woman represents. And in, in a sense, I think Shakespeare's Hamlet loves Ophelia for this. He genuinely loves her. She represents uh, innocence, the very thing that we prize Ophelia for on the stage. Her, her brother loves her for it, her father. Everyone, because she's so good. She represents an idealized, ver she's very naive. She represents a beauty that's not mixed up in politics. She's not calculating. She's not manipulating. She's willing to do what her father tells her to do. She's willing to listen to her older brother who's giving her counsel. She's being everybody. And here's the problem. She's caught up, and this is the tragedy of Ophelia. It's called the tragedy of Hamlet, Hamlet Prince of Denmark. But there's also a tragedy of Ophelia. And the tragedy of Ophelia is that she is the one innocent in the whole play. And she is manipulated by everybody around her. Not, not calculatingly, but they're directing her. Her father's directing her. Her brother's directing her. Hamlet, who loves her and sees that she's caught up in the mess, the contagion of Denmark, is going to have to act towards her in a way that goes perhaps against his own feelings. And he's going to have to not love her the way she did because she's been pulled up into the machinations of the court. And in the end, she goes mad because she loses her role and her identity. Ends up floating in the water, like the uh, pre-Raphaelite painting. Just falls into the water and just lets herself sink. She has no agency, no ability to swim. She probably could swim, but just lies and passively sinks beneath the water. In a sense, she is an, an analogous to Hamlet. But Hamlet has more agency than she does. She has none. As a daughter, she's subject to her father. Her father's alive. Um, in relation to Hamlet, he cannot act in accordance 
with his love towards her because his whole being has had his uh, agency taken away from him. He can't be himself. He has to act in a different way. And so what he, the, the second best thing he can do is to push her away. So I, I, I never loved you. I don't want you. Go to a nunnery. Distresses her enormously. Does he mean it? I don't think he does. I think he would prefer a different course and outcome, but he has no choice. The best he can do here, he pushes her away. Um, and uh, and, and it, he, she finds this enormously distressing. And then Polonius, who is acting on behalf of the evil Claudius, gets murdered for this. And Ophelia, who's obeyed her father's wishes, finds her father killed. Hamlet, who she loves, against her. Claudius and Gertrude see her as a tool to get at Hamlet, and everything is bad for her. Her whole life is ruined. This is how um, evil works, by the way. Remember, think of the orthodox portrait of evil. Evil is the privation of the good. Good is partly in relation to your identity and your, your roles. Let's say you take away a mother's child and the mother will go mad. You're taking a role away. You're taking a relationship, but you're taking a role away. They lose something of themselves and, they're, and they lose their sanity because their sanity, their wholeness, their health is partly in, lived out in relationship. And that is taken away. Now, Ophelia is having her identity chipped away on a gradual way in the way that Hamlet does all at once, bang. Like in one fell swoop, his, he's gone. And he's trying to recover himself, and he does recover to himself to some degree. She slowly has her identity taken from her. And because she was naive, she never really had a full-blown agency anyway. At any rate, she was a daughter who was being prepared for a husband. She would have found her identity in union with a, with a man and had it when, when her father was alive, once her father's dead, and her beloved Hamlet is pushing her away, and her brother just wants to kill Hamlet, and the king doesn't actually care about his own son, is simply after him, she has no idea what to do. And so the evil is seen in the privation of the goodness of Ophelia. Her roles are all gone. There's nothing left. I think it's a consistent, persistent, and uh, compelling portrait in a way. So. When Hamlet walks in here, Act 2, Scene 1, let me step back a little bit here to the previous scene. 74. Is that, have I got it right? No, that can't be right. I'll pick it up at 85. Ophelia speaking to Polonius, her father. Oh, my Lord, my Lord, I have been so affrighted. With what in the name of God? My Lord, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet with his doublet, all unbraced. So he has a shirt and it's, it's opened up. No hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, ungartered. Remember the garters hold your socks up. They don't have elastics in them, so it's socks falling down to his ankles. And down jived to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, with a look so piteous in purport, as if he'd been lucid out of hell, to speak of horrors, he comes before me. Mad for thy love, my lord, I do not know, but truly I do fear it. What said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then he goes to the length of all his arm, and with his other hand, thus o'er his brow, he falls to such perusal of my face as he would draw it, Long stayed he so, at last a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head, thus waving up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. That done, he lets me go, and with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way through his, without his eyes, and for out of doors he went without their helps, and to the last bended their light on me. So he goes looking at her as he's going out this way. 
as if he loves her and and that image that he sees in front of her is simply one he's going to have to let go and um, this will create a an a, a second distress in Hamlet's mind remember he's already been disillusioned by the way his mother has behaved towards his father her willingness and ability to, to rapidly transfer her affections from a greater man to a lesser man in great speed. The relationship of husband and wife seemingly nothing, and now she has a new one and she's going to be able to carry on just like that. Her father, or his father, has said that she's fragile and yet you should have sympathy for her. As the son, he finds this very difficult. He finds it very difficult because he loved his father so. And his, his mother is able, because she's so frail, is a, almost is driven to have a new relationship and to wholly live in it without any sense of contradiction. Something has been deprived of her very deeply as well, and she copes with it by carrying on in the role, uninterrupted more or less. His father actually has compassion for his wife in this because he knows her frailty and he's not judging her for it. Hamlet, as the son, is immature and says that frailty thy name is woman. And it leads him to doubt man in general as a piece of work of God. What a piece of work is man, right? So this speech. He's reflecting on the frailty of human nature, its inability to hold itself. But he's really reflecting on the broader themes of the play in the context of the Christian faith, the consequences of what evil does to people's psyches and how they act. But by the time we get to Act 3, Scene 1, his disillusionment with people and his particularly directed towards women, the deceitfulness, the deceptiveness of women, which is a common medieval trope to talk about how women have betrayed men over the course of the ages from Eve onwards, pretty much, um, is now applied to uh, his own situation. So where can I go to Act 3, Scene 1? I, the only thing I don't like about this version is this, and I'm going to want to come back to this play within the play as well. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> let me deal with the play within the play and then jump back so I'll just stay in uh, in accordance with the acts and scenes and I'll come back to his existential crisis as it were as it's expressed in act three Let, act two scene two the play within the play <clears throat> is going to help him try and carry the tragedy forward so that he can revenge, take revenge, and to act as God's agent on earth. Remember, the king is the judge and the jury in the ancient world, and to some degree in Shakespeare's world as well, although they will separate the, the, the branches. And this is in keeping with, with biblical teaching that the king will no longer be the judge. There will be a judiciary. There will be Levites that will fulfill this function. It need not be Moses that has to adjudicate over every situation. The king is not the judge as well. He has a different role. You will separate the powers. There's an there's a, um, executive branch, there's a judicial branch, etc. There's a legislative branch. These will be separated in the form of Western governments in accordance with biblical doctrine. Um, but a, as far as the Renaissance ideal goes, the king should be a good judge, just like God is, the, is, is uh, both the uh, the king and the judge and the provider of all things. The king also represents those things in some ways in a monarchy. Um, <clears throat> so I'll come back to the act three after the break, but let's go to the play within the play. Hamlet says goodbye to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, sends them off having found out that they are being manipulated by the king. He's, he orchestrates a different uh, trajectory for them and he's going to effectively have to cut them loose and have them killed um, but in 
response to this, his monologue, his soliloquy is, is as follows. Now I am alone. Remember Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, these are childhood friends. So he's just lost more of his identity. He's nobody. Now I am alone. The feeling of being abandoned by all your friends makes Hamlet, again, is almost a Christ figure. Not played up so much as we will see that uh, in uh, King Lear, Cordelia seemed like a suffering servant, um, but deprived of so many things. Hamlet's shorn of these roles, and it's part of the work of evil that it happened. But anyway, now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous? Oh, we're just, sorry, I've skipped the wrong, I, I've skipped ahead to the response to the play rather than the play within the play. I'll get to this. I'm going to finish the speech and then I'll go backwards. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit. And all for nothing, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him, the actor? And he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her. What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. And yet I, a dull and muddy metal rascal, peak like dawn of dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. No, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who, call, who calls me villain? Breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie of the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this? Ha! Swoons, I should take it, for it cannot be, but I am pigeon livered and lacked gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this, I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's awful, that is the king. Bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. Oh, vengeance. Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave, that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab, a stallion, fie upon it, foe about my brains. Hmm, I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck. So did the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tent him to the quick. If he do blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be a devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. There you go. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. So he is a player who's just seen a scene. He's seen dramatizations of lament, which are just being acted, and yet he can't act in this way. So he sees in the theater himself uh, as a spectator, as well as a director. So he sees it from all sides, and he sees his own life being mirrored in art as well, and he's, it, it's helping to teach him how to act. And then he's going to utilize that in order to 
deal with reality as it, it, it confronts him, which is a demon potentially in disguise has told him to murder his father and he must deal with that reality. So it's a very complicated situation. It's not just that he's uh, distressed at the loss of his father and lost his place in the court and his, his life has been brought into chaos. He worries about his soul. So I must not be misled by a demon to do this. I must make sure. And here's how I'm going to make sure. I'll use a play. That's how I will do that. So of all of the plays, and this is why I ended up putting this one at the end of the sequence of the tragedies I'm looking at, um, I put this one here because it's the fullest representation of the dramaturge figure of the, of the playwright and at the same time of the very dramaturge figure as a spectator. He's taking in multiple roles and showing it from multiple sides how important art is in directing us rightly. But the player that is here is presented, and I'll break right after this, uh, is presented before Polonius and Hamlet. And it's all here in italics. And uh, Hamlet, the players come in, Hamlet greets them and asks that they um, present a scene for him. And the scene is Hecuba and Pyrrhus. What speech do you want to hear, my lord? 458. I, I heard thee speak me a speech once, but it was never acted. Or if it was, not, not above once. For the play I remember, please not the million. T'was caviar to the general. Caviar, it was caviar. It was too rich, it was too important and they didn't have a taste for it. They didn't have the refined excellence to appreciate this play, but it was a really good, important scene. But it was, as I received it, and others whose judgments in such matters cried in the top of mine, even with superior judgment, an excellent play, well digested in the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember one said there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savory nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affection, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as speech, and by very much more handsome than fine. One speech in it I chiefly love, t'was Aeneas's tale to Dido. Remember when Dido goes mad? And thereabout of it, especially when he speaks of Priam's daughter, slaughter, if it live in your memory, begin at this line, let me see, let me see, the rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyrcanian beast, tis not so. It begins with Pyrrhus, the rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the knight resemble when he lay couched in the om ominous horse, hath now his dread and black complexion smeared with more hail. And he has memorized the whole scene, recites them by memory to the player, and asks him to proceed. And Polonius, for God, my Lord, well spoken with good accent and good discretion. He's shocked at how well he has remembered the lines. And so then the player goes on and recounts it once again. Polonius' response, this is too long, shows himself a bad critic, incapable of appreciating its caviar. It's a little too rich, a little bit too exalted for Polonius. Polonius is, is a simple man, does not appreciate what's in front of him. This is too long. Hamlet, it shall to the barbers with your beard. Prithee say on. So your beard's too long. He's for a jig or a tale of bawdry. Or he sleeps, say on. Come to Hecuba. And ah, oh, woe had seen the Moblad Queen. The Moblad Queen? That's good. Moblad Queen is good. Polonius is a fool. He's, not, he, he's a bad audience in the sense that he has no, he's a, he has common tastes. It's not that he's a bad man. He has common taste. This is not appealing to him. Remember, Shakespeare's audience has multiple agents within its uh, uh, context. We have the aristocrats there, and we have aristocrats on stage for them to model themselves after. We have commoners in Shakespeare's plays. They're represented. They're right in front of Shakespeare on the stage, on the floor, standing in front of him. And then you have the middle classes, all three parties being represented in Shakespeare's plays quite regularly. And Polonius, 
Polonius is not aristocratic in his tastes, and he doesn't understand these things, and ha Hamlet is to some degree uh, making fun of him. Polonius' response to the uh, lines, look where he has not turned his color and has tears in his eyes. Prithee no more. He hasn't blanched. You know, he's making a superficial judgment. But the lines were delivered. And what's Hamlet's judgment? Tis well. I have seen thee speak out the rest of this soon. I'll have thee. So I'm going to hear this later. I have to, I have to listen to Polonius, this, and I, I can't stand <laughs> hearing his commentary on this. This is painful to me. Good, my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? Do you hear? Let them be well used. For they are the abstract and brief chronicles of this time. There you go. What's the function of theater? It's actually, in some sense, a snapshot of the zeitgeist of the age. If you want to understand a culture, look at its art, for good or for ill. That when I teach English literature, I think that's what I'm doing to some degrees. I'm, I'm actually expressing the mindset cultivated and expressed in art by the best playwrights and the best authors. And you can compare it from age to age and you can see the influence of different religious viewpoints, different uh, complexities of the day. They're being played out on stage. They are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time. After your death, you were better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. In other words, don't piss off the artists. <laughs> because the report that you hear around that you care so much about, but Justin Trudeau right now is trying to bring, bring a censorship bill, online censorship. He's worried about what people are saying about him, around him, and so forth. His infamy will last beyond the ages in trying to stifle dissent. You can stop people's mouths around you by imprisoning them. You can't stop your reputation if you should do such things. That you cannot stop. That will last. And so beware not to play the tyrant. And my lord, uh, in response to this, Polonius says, my lord, I will use them according to their desert, as they deserve. Measure for measure. Hamlet, God's bodkins man, much better. Use every man after his desert, and who shall escape whipping? Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Now he's teaching us how to be a gracious audience. Treat people better than they deserve. Show them grace. Show them appreciation. Yes, it's not well done, but it's a play and they're doing their best. You have a, play, a role to play in receiving as well. It's a moral duty, actually, in receiving. When your children present uh, something in front of you and they're really terrible and we're chuckling at them because they're not good, we owe them not to laugh at them, to appreciate it. It's part of, it's called condescension. And this is not contempt. It's not looking down upon. It's condescending in the sense that you are going to receive them as they are with grace you're going to, from your station as an aristocrat, you are going to allow yourself to dignify the commoners who are presenting the play, just like we saw in A Midsummer Night's Dream. The uh, uh, Oberon and Titania see this ridiculous play in front of them, and they don't, and they sort of chuckling aside, but then they say how wonderful it is. And that's how God treats us. That's the final line of analogy. God does not give us as we deserve. He receives good service with the well done, good and faithful servant each time. Come, sirs, follow them as friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow, etc. And then he gives this speech that I read already. Next time I'll come on to his direction to the play and, and um, his instruction on how to uh, properly direct a play also important. Important also in his own reflections on his own actions because he's a dramaturge figure and is trying to use a play to catch the conscience of the king, etc., etc. But I'll pick it up after the break.